Welcome everyone. This event is being presented by the SJSU Special Library Association Student Chapter, or otherwise known as SLASC. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Tina kremsner Shing, and I'm the Programming Director of SLASC. I want to give a huge thank you to my programming team, April Pantel and Rebecca Kamathi, and the greater SLASC teams for helping make this event possible. We are honored to conclude our 2021 fall programming semester with Baja Delaska Elliott, who is not only an SJSU iSchool alum, but also a co-founder of the revived SLA student chapter here at SJSU. So we're especially appreciative that she can make it um, to present with us tonight. And so Baja is a health sciences education and research librarian at the Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. She serves as an engagement librarian for educational research and clinical units at the university and is active in various medical library associations around the country. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat. And time permitting, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. We will also be sharing a brief survey link that we hope you will take at the end of our presentation. And to save some bandwidth, we're going to ask that you turn off your video and but feel free to open your mic during the question time. And then um, I think that is it. So thank you. And let's warmly welcome Baja. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tina. It is a pleasure and an honor to be talking to you today. And to, in a way, visit my old stomping grounds. Thank you for mentioning this, Tina. Um, this group was very important to me when I was a student at the iSchool. So I'm happy to see you. All right, so I'm going to try something here. And, oh, of course, how am I going to do that now? Let me test it on Amy. No, it did not work. Sorry. So let me escape, uh, escape, escape out of this for a second. I'm going to try. And um, hmm. apologies for all these technical difficulties. Um, Zoom is not allowing me to uh, get out of the presentation mode for some reason. And I was hoping to enjoy a moment of um, play with you and um, use our Jamboard here to ask you this question. But maybe we can do it um, this way without the fun Jamboard feature. So tell me, where do you think health sciences librarians work? And please just put your answers in the um, the answers in, your, in the chat while I'm trying to figure out how I can get to my Jamboard from here. Yes, so uh, <laughs> I see lots of great answers, insurance companies, nursing schools, hospitals, corporate libraries, universities, research institutions. Yes, and my apologies for giving you the sneak peek of the answers to those questions, and you are absolutely right. Health sciences librarians work in all of those places, in academic health sciences centers, which may include um, serving schools of medicine, nursing, dentistry, chiropractic, osteopathic, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, public health, uh, but also natural medicine, oriental medicine, etc., as well as supporting the research and healthcare missions of those institutions in hospital libraries, um, in specialized libraries, such as association libraries, cancer treatment centers, or a large physician group practices, in corporate libraries, which include pharmaceutical companies and device manufacturing companies, um, insurance companies, health information sites, such as WebMD or Health Lines, for example, community college libraries, which can be associated with um, health, health, health profession programs, all consumer health libraries, which may be also associated with hospitals or treatment centers.
So now that we have established a few places that how science, sciences librarians work, let's talk about what they what they or we do. And I'm still hunting and pecking here to see if I can somehow. OK, hold on. Let me see. All right. So now I can perhaps get, get to my fun. No, I still can't get to it even. Oh, here it is. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to try, despite the fact that, of course, now you can see this presentation and all the answers. Um, I wanted a little bit more engagement and I wanted to make sure that we all have fun here. So let me see if this will work. I'm going to, in the chat, I'm going to no, actually, this won't work anyway, because I won't be able to see the Jamboard with this. Oh, well, I've tried. I can maybe share it. Let's see if this will work. Roger, is there anything we can do on our end to help? Yeah, I think it'll be okay. okay. I'm not really, I'm just going to plug away and talk and not worry about all of my fancy <laughs> technical things that are not working. <laughs> so if you could put in the chat, uh, what do you think? hospital all of health sciences librarians do, even though you saw some of the answers already, just uh, let your imaginations go. Research support, research for doctors. Publish in less and less journals, help with patient questions. Those are all really excellent guesses. We don't do research for students. Students have to do their own research themselves, just like in any other library. Help with consumer health questions, great. So yes, um, this is what we do. Conducting, um, conducting patient care, hospital policy and procedure literature searches. Uh, we can also, this can be for individual patient care, research for um, opening new units in hospitals, for example, best practices for treatment, um, but also some global issues. Have health sciences librarians were supporting health departments, for example, at the start of the COVID epidemic with searches on reusing um, personal protective equipment or possible treatments um, and much more. Really, we were all incredibly busy at the beginning of the epidemic. I am I'm going to include, I'll send you a link later since um, the Zoom is not behaving the way I was expecting to today. I am going to include a link to a resource page created by librarians for other librarians that include search search strategies and um, other resources that you can use to look at um, what has been, you know, if you want to keep sort of um, current with all the developments in COVID. Um, similar pages were created also for the lay public, for, for, for the public and um, lay people. Um, librarians at Providence, but you know, just helping health departments was not the only things that things that librarians were actually doing. Librarians at Providence St. Joseph Health researched what kind of materials and constructions would work best for cloth masks, and if cloth cloth masks were even feasible as a, a way of um, you know keeping the spread of the of COVID for people outside of the healthcare environment. And um, they even sold the prototype of one of the very first uh, cloth masks that was used or prototypes for uh, masks that were then later on mass produced and were sort of were, this all became part of the Providence health system million mask campaign. So ways in which um, librarians can help are really very diverse. Um, another way in which um, librarians can help is um, by contributing to the development of new treatments, products, and services as members of university, pharmaceutical, and um, medical equipment research teams. 
Many librarians are included as authors on healthcare systematic reviews as well. Um, I before coming here, I did a quick search to look for librarian for the word librarian in PubMed. And of course, there are a number of articles on actual medical libraries in PubMed, um, which you may already be, be familiar with, and you know that it's the premier and the largest health sciences database um, in the English language. And um, came up with 4,400 entries for librarians in PubMed. We also teach students, staff, and health professionals how to find, access, and evaluate information. So um, somebody mentioned finding information for um, for clinicians or for physicians, we definitely do that. As far as students are concerned, we're definitely teaching them how to fish rather than do the fishing for them. Um, typically, the instructions that we do is health literacy or is um, information literacy instruction. So we show students how to find medical subject headings and conduct searches in databases. Uh, attending some clinical librarians attend morning rounds with the healthcare team and bring latest information and also research to the patient side and sometimes help with decision making with uh, clinical decision making right there at the bedside. But we also do geeky stuff too. So this includes, I'm going to throw in all of the um, accreditation and committee stuff into the geeky stuff into the geeky part as well here. Um, although they can be different ways in which librarians contribute. They can on the in the committees, they can in hospitals as well as universities, they can work um, on they can work on patient safety committees, resources committees, or accreditation committees. Um, for example, now at OHSU, I am a member of a undergraduate medical education resources subcommittee. So we work really um, on problems ranging from afford or, or finding affordable textbooks for students and how to best make, you know, leverage library materials and library, library resources to um, help students to really looking at the things like um, food and housing and security among students. So the geeky stuff also can be collection management, uh, web design, digital libraries, blog posts, and other things. Depending on your setting, um, you know, in the academic library world, you can be, your work can be very specialized. The same can be true for research team. However, if you are working at a hospital library, you're likely to have to be sort of a, Jack or Jill of all trades, running a hospital library can be really like running a small business. So this is just a pretty illustration, really, from a um, graphic from the Medical Library Association that shows some of the questions that health sciences librarians get asked. Um, you know, I talked about in general, in more general terms of what kind of information we provide, but here you can see some examples of what we actually do, uh, do get, get asked. So how to publish, is the journal credible, how to find the right journal to publish your article in, um, and then everything that comes with it, how reliable, important the journal is, but also how to perhaps um, write the manuscript so it would be published and so on. How do I make my research reproducible? This is a very important question, especially in the health, health sciences right now. As you can imagine, there's um, considering how much research is actually going on and what is happening, this is an area that is still growing. We're still trying to understand what are the best ways to make research reproducible. Typically people share their search strategies right now, but that can be an unreliable way to do it for a number of different reasons. And so, um, you know, many librarians are looking at ways of coding, searching in a way that makes it reproducible. Some databases allow you to search an actual link to a fully um, conducted search or fully fleshed out search. So people can, do, people can simply retrace your steps that way. But um, especially in systematic reviews, if that's a term that you're familiar with, um, you know, there's a lot of the, that search 
strategy part and how you come about even figuring out what your search strategy is and then and then conducting the research and and reporting it that is an integral part of really good of a good systematic review how can i buy find best clinical evidence so you know we get into questions of information literacy here in both um, finding the right kind of articles as well as understanding what the difference is between background questions and where to find the best information for that and foreground questions and how to where to look for the information and how to look for it and of course accessible patient resources in multiple languages are always a huge and a growing area and librarians are involved in um, aggregating those and um, also in disseminating those how to deal with an article that was retracted. That's a question that I very recently had um, in a research that somebody was conducting, they were going to um, publish. And um, several of the articles that spoke specifically to the research that this person was doing were retracted for ethical reasons. So that is, it might seem like a simple reason to simply say, do not use retracted article, retracted, retracted, retracted articles, but it may depend on so many different things, such as how much research is done in the field already, um, the reason for the retraction, or whether um, if there were ethical questions about conducting the research, but there it's only one, those articles are only um, are a handful of a very small research pool do we or, or do we not use them to benefit future generations so complex issues complex questions that are always part of what we are thinking about so how do health health sciences librarians do their work and somebody asked some of those questions I would actually love for people to start chiming in as I'm speaking. I um, specifically prepared um, this presentation in such a way that it sort of welcomes questions. So I'll go through this quickly and I'll pause after this slide so uh, people can chime in, unmute themselves or put the questions in the chat, whichever way you prefer is fine with me. So let's talk about education and preparation. There are a few um, people frequently ask this question is there any special education required this may depend some academic centers where librarians are tenured or um, uh, faculty may require that you have some kind of an undergraduate or even a graduate degree in the health sciences but generally that is not the case some i schools and that includes um, the sjsu i school um, in offer classes in health sciences librarianship. Um, if you are interested in the health sciences librarianship that I highly recommend that you take it. Um, the job itself is really about excellent research and outreach skills. So if you come in to the field in, you know, with a feeling that you are a lifelong learner, that you understand, understand research tools and specifically searching databases, and that you can you feel comfortable with the whole idea of a reference interview reaching out to your audience reaching out to the stakeholders finding out what they need and helping them that you should be fine if there are classes that um, the iSchool is offering right now that um, touch on these topics i would highly recommend that you take them I want to say as somebody who was in first an English major, then a liberal studies major, and then ended up in a hospital library as a library technician sort of by accident, that um, there are many opportunities to learn on the job, both at your institution as well as through um, courses offered by the network of the National Libraries of Medicine. Um, and its parent organization, the National Library of Medicine. Um, and I will talk about an NLM a little bit later. And also by the Medical Library Association. Uh, the Medical Library Association is um, the national health organization for health sciences librarians. And I have been using a lot of information from their site today. Um, you'll see some other graphics um, and, and you know the, um, from their website. MLA is another great resource for learning and networking. 
on the job, you will be using primarily databases for searching. Of course, since you um, might be doing education, systems librarianships, or other, other things as well, other tools will also be important, but every health sciences librarian needs to know the basic resources in the health sciences. So databases such as uh, Medline PubMed, which, as I mentioned, is the largest health sciences um, database in the in the English language right now. I think it's a, it stands at about 34 million citations in the health sciences. CINAHL, excuse me, which is the cumulative index for um, allied health nursing and allied health literature, the Cochrane Library, which is um, the home of the Cochrane Collaboration. Excuse me, a systematics review service, Micromedics, which is um, a pharmaceutical platform, and many more. I'm happy to talk about those in more depth when we get to the question and answer question uh, period. And also really you need to sort of familiarize yourself with core medical, nursing, pharmacy, or whatever discipline you'll be working in resources. Um, what was I what was I going to say? I kind of lost my uh, thread for a second here. Um, you will be able to learn a lot of things and you are you're going to have to really do that you just sort of throw yourself into the topic and you learn all you can and you will be able to um, do this from the organizations I mentioned just make sure that you keep on learning and stay on top of all the current developments in the clinical healthcare management as well as, as well as population health topics you can do it in a number of different ways by setting up database alerts and um, database or newslet newsletter alerts and really familiarizing yourself with the resources on the web. Um, there are many societies and many great organizations that are sort of champions in, in the field, such as um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement or Becker Hospitals or um, the Advisory Board, which are all organizations which have online presence and sites and alerts and they are really they really aggregate um, what is happening in the health sciences and healthcare management and population health. So let's learn a little bit more about health sciences librarianship. Um, the according to the Medical Library Association um, in 2013, and I recognize that those stats are pretty old, but those are apparently the most current ones that we have. Um, there were 2,645 health sciences librarians in the US and um, close to 2,500 additional librarians outside of the US. Health sciences libraries in the, are organized in the network of the National Library of Medicine which until recently was called the network of the National Libraries of Medicine. So I have to kind of think about it when, I say, when I'm saying the name. Um, the NNLM current, currently has 5,600 5, member institutions. And um, this includes um, a number of institutions in different fields. So I, this is a screenshot of NNLM members in the uh, San Jose area. And as you can see, the libraries range from college, university, um, health system like Kaiser to a parent group. On the right, you have um, the organization type. So any of those organizations or any of these organizations that fall into those categories. So public libraries, community colleges, community-based organizations, clinics, K through 12 schools, associations, and more can all become members of the network of the National Library of Medicine. The membership to the member organization is completely free. Everybody who is a staff member at those organizations has access to all of the NNLM resources. Um, the requir requirements for joining are really minimal. 
and um, you know the joining really allows the staff to take classes, applied for grant grants and all kinds of other funding and awards. For example, um, when I worked at um, as a health as a hospital librarian, and we were just um, integrating our library team as the system expanded. I applied for and received a grant to purchase laptops, conferencing software, and screencasting software um, that we were able to distribute to the entire team. So even ahead of the, the large health system becoming integrated, the library became integrated in many different ways, and this was one of them. So how do health sciences librarians make a difference in clinical care? There's a lot of research that shows how librarians help with the decision making, especially when it comes to influencing clinical outcomes. The graphic in this slide um, cites result from a study published in 2013 by um, Joanne Marshall, Jane Solenberger, and um, Sandy Esterby Garnett, Gannett, I'm sorry, I can't remember her um, name all of a sudden, and showed that 95% of physicians made better clinical decisions, uh, 40 changed advice given to patients, 33 changed the choice of drug or a prescription, 25 changed a diagnosis based on information received from a library, from a medical librarian. So, Think about that for a second and think about the impact of that um, on the on the care and what's um, you know what what is happening in the health sciences libraries. This is just a, a tip of the iceberg of the research that has already been done. And um, if you are interested in looking this up, Joanne Marshall is really kind of a pioneer in this field. But there are a lot of um, articles that discuss, especially how hospital libraries influence what is happening at their at their respective institution and how healthcare and um, patient care is impacted. In addition to affecting patient care, of course, health sciences librarians also influence the learning of the staff and um, presentations, pr conference, pr you know, pr presentations at conference publishing and other things as well. These are all very important findings, uh, but more research is definitely needed. Tracking the impact of librarianship on is, is really difficult, or librarians or li library information is really difficult. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an initiative where um, a university, um, University of Missouri, I believe, librarians, along with the with several local hospitals hired uh, healthcare economists to try and determine, actually assign and um, return on investment on librarian contributions. So there are a lot of tools out there that show return on investment, but typically those tools discuss um, costs of purchasing services or pur purchasing materials and how much um, you know, how having a librarian on site and a library on site really affects it and makes it um, makes it less expensive and more reliable. And uh, typically those are really good. Those kinds of tools really shine a really good light on the library and make the library and the librarian contribution look really great. However, administ hospital administrators or um, Clinicians may find them a little underwhelming because those studies are typically conducted by librarians for librarians and they only look at library metrics. So as a result of that, that project of hiring healthcare economists to trace, to sort of try and um, trace how librarians care or how librarian information coming from librarians or librarians work impacts um, different benchmarks or different measurements within the healthcare system was born and so they try to um, trace specific requests for information to patient care as well as um, 
specific requests for in information to patient safety outcomes. But unfortunately, it turned out that the um, sort of the chain of custody between when the information is actually acquired and to when the intervention is introduced, unless it's in the physician's office or in a really simple situation where a physician asks for that information and asks and then acts on it, which is our clinician, I should say, because that could include nurses and pharmacists as well, which is what you see here. It's nearly impossible to really trace that. So we're still working on that part. If any of you brilliant list students have any ideas on how we can do it, please share with us. We are really open to any ideas on how to do it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience at this point. And I'm going to say that I have worked both as an hospital and an academic librarian. Uh, my career at the hospital started accidentally, as I mentioned, as a, I started as a technician and then worked there for many years before I was finally able to go back to school and get my library degree. But even as a library technician, I was involved in many of those same things that um, the hospital librarians do, in part because hospital library teams can be very small. So everybody really needs to be involved in most aspects of the work there. And one of the, one of the very first things I have here is so the column on the left is the column for hospitals. And the column on the right is the column for academic librarians. So one of the very first and most important tasks of working as a hospital librarian is um, doing direct literature searching for patient care. And um, my first introduction to that was when I was a two-week newbie, um, again, a library, tech, library technician at a hospital. And I received a phone call. This is, it's going to um, really age me or, you know, so that's quite all right. I have, I feel comfortable with it. I was by myself in the library on a Friday afternoon. The last person there, since I was typically closing the library on Fridays, and I received a phone call from um, a chief resident who was asking me to do a um, urgent patient care search to look for information for a specific condition. And um, the medication that was typically given for it was not working. So he was looking for other alternatives. And I conducted the search. I was able to find just one article that described the exact conditions that he was talking about. So I paged him and he called me back. And all I had was really the abstract up to the article. And um, the only way I could get the full text of the article was to ask one of the fellow libraries to fax it to me. But the information, he asked me to read the abstract to him over the phone and the information that um, I read to him was sufficient. And he said, we don't need the whole article. This, this will work. So print it out, please print it out. And I'm going to send a medical student there to pick it up. And of course, I did that, but I didn't actually think anything was going to happen. So I, the, the student did show up just as soon as I was done and I handed them the piece of paper and then went home for the weekend and didn't think anything of it for the rest of the weekend. And then when I arrived at work on Monday morning, the very first thing that happened was um, the chief resident came into the library to thank me profusely from doing the search and explained to me that um, they had an issue where a patient was bleeding on a, literally on the table in the emergency room and was not, um, none of the typical clotting factors that they were going to give, they, were, they were typically, would typically give to patients was working because of a, a very specific condition that this person had. And so basically the article that I was able to provide so it saved her from bleeding out. They were transfusing blood and they were just at their wits end trying to figure out how to stop it. So that was a moment in my life where I sat down before I only thought of myself as a library person. I already had experience from two large academic libraries working in different aspects of it. And so I thought of myself as just being a library person and 
um, you know, a library paraprofessional and understood that aspect of it. Um, I had always been pretty good at research. So when I started working at the hospital library, I was excited that that was such a big part of the um, job there. But when this happened, um, when I had this experience, it really made me sit down and stop to think about what I was doing. It seemed like a whole lot of responsibility it made me wonder if I wanted to continue working there, but it also most importantly made me just realize that I needed to learn the skills that were necessary to do the job as well as possible. So that is what I set out to do. Um, as a hospital librarian, moving on to a lighter stuff, as a hospital librarian, you may be also researching for administrative needs. One of the things that I did at the hospital um, where I worked was, for example, um, do research on a specific kind of a unit that the hospital wanted to open. And by, by doing research on it, it means that we covered all of the aspects of it that were as needed. So. At first, I looked at information on uh, financial plausibility, then on what other hospitals in the country were actually doing this. Then we were looking to see of what, did what would be needed, what kind of equipment and space and other things would be needed to open a, um, a unit like that. Then we were looking to see what kind of patients would benefit from being in this unit. So. As you can see, it just kind of, it can cover a whole gamut and it can be really involved. You work very closely with the clinical and administrative teams and it's, um, it's a really special relationship. Hospital policies, working on hospital policies is very similar to that. That may include working on policies on specific floors. So that may include work, uh, working for information on um, best practices on how to treat something or um, how to take care of patients on, with specific conditions on the floor and so on. But then of course you do support research. So um, some clinical, clinical research happens at hospitals. Um, other kinds of research also happen and uh, you would be supporting that. You do support education. Many hospital systems now um, are partnering with um, are partnering with um, schools health, that have of health prof professions or are teaching hospitals. So you may be working with um, undergraduate students or residents. And finally, you are also um, going to be supporting patients and providing consumer information. The mix is very different in an academic library. A large part of what I do is devoted now to instruction education and research. Um, I jokingly say I am a, um, because I am an engagement librarian for a number of, edu of educational or academic units. I jokingly say that October is the month where I fall behind on all of my other tasks at work because I have so many instruction sessions set out. Um, in October of 2020, I, in one month, I had over 30 instruction sessions set up. So you can imagine <laughs> what that really looks like. Um, we do a lot of education, also one-on-one, -on -one, and not just students, but also faculty and um, residents and graduate, um, you know, PhD and doctoral students and so on. We support research in a much more robust way than hospital librarians do. We have a lighter engagement with clinical units and with administrative units. And we do some patient and consumer information, and this may just be the um, environments in which I have worked, but um, I, in, the, in my role as a hospital librarian, I worked with many more patients that I have worked um, as an academic librarian. So um, those are some basic things. Oh yes, one thing that I wanted to say is that both of those um, settings have one thing in common and is that they require a lot of research, uh, a lot of outreach, I'm sorry, outreach to administrators, physicians, nurses, and other clinicians and researchers. 
uh, you want to make sure that the library is always visible and you always want to make sure that you are addressing uh, addressing their needs so you want to be involved with each of your organizations and make sure that you participate on as many committees as possible and you are really aware of what the needs of the um, organization might be that may be something that is um, shared or um, communicated through newsletters or staff updates or other things really um, the job of a health sciences librarian is to stay on top of that and then provide services or um, to really address those needs. So that is something that both of those jobs have in common. Outreach and library marketing are kind of things that I feel very passionate about. And so I'm always happy to talk about it. If anybody has questions about this, please let me know. But um, that is where I think I would like to pause and just give you a couple of um, fun readings. One is the, I would like to I'll take a look at the New England Journal of Medicine Library Hub. You will find a lot of great prof profiles of great library, health sciences librarians, but also you will kind of get an idea of what health sciences librarians discuss. Um, I put the link to this 21st century medical librarian more vital than ever um, here, even though it's a little bit older article in part because it quotes the former OHSU director, Chris Schaefer, but also because rereading it in 2000, I remember when that article came out in 2017, I thought that it had some revolutionary ideas. Rereading it in 2021 puts a really interesting perspective on it. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and I want to know if you have any questions for me. And please unmute yourself if you'd like to, or um, if somebody, if wh whoever is moderating, Tina or April, if you're moderating the chat, please let me know what I've missed and what I need to answer. Excellent. Thank you so much, Basha, for that amazing, amazing presentation. I'm Rebecca. I'm also one of the other people from the programming team. So lovely to see you. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. Um, as also, everyone's been really absorbed in your presentation. So if you have any other questions, just pop them into the chat box and we'll definitely ask. Um, the first question we have here is from Irene and they're asking, what work background did you have before getting your MLIS? So um, great question. And I was uh, really, I kind of um, fell into libraries when I first came to the US. I um, was living on campus and um, started applying for jobs in different places. And I was living at the time on the Cornell campus and they were looking for somebody who, um, excuse me, too, man, too much speaking. Those are all the teaching <laughs> engagements I was mentioning earlier, who um, spoke Slavic languages and could read Slavic languages, both in um, Roman and Cyrillic alphabet. And so I applied for the job and got it. And it was my first library job in the US. And so completely not related to the medical field at all. Um, then my next job was at the University of Michigan libraries. And I worked there in different positions, but also none of them, one of them was in acquisitions and another one was in um, serials and microphones services supervising the reading room and desk and the serials and microphone services there. So again, nothing to do with libraries. One of my jobs, the acquisitions job at the University of Michigan Library, I did deal, I was the approval plan coordinator and um, I don't know if um, approval, you may already be familiar with this term and approval plans is a way of ordering uh, resources for the library where the books actually come into the library and then um, they are um, sort of selected by librarians and things that are not kept are returned. But um, so I managed all of the approval plans for the University of Michigan Library with 30 different vendors and for all the different schools. And one of the schools that I was working with um, or the I was working with the School of Nursing, the, the School of Medicine, and also the School of Dentistry. And that was really my first exposure to medical 
or um, any kind of health sciences materials. So when I came to, when I started the job at my hospital as a, um, you know, as a library technician, I was completely, I was completely new to the field and just had to learn how to deal with everything. The most the difficult part, part I think of at first was dealing with anybody calling in and um, asking for any help because I didn't know how to spell anything. So it was always this sort of embarrassing moment and you wanted to make sure that you didn't, um, you didn't make a complete fool <laughs> of yourself as people were, um, you know, telling you how to spell words that of course they were dealing with every day. But thank you for asking that question. Excellent. It's actually really awesome to hear where you've come from and how you, you've gotten to this point. You know, <laughs> a lot of people come <laughs> from different backgrounds and uh, it's just uh, really, really fun to hear about your journey, Basha. Um, <laughs> the next question. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's a little crazy. I know. <laughs> of course, now I don't remember anymore what it's not like not what it's like not to be in this field. I love and I love to hear that you're loving it, too, and that you're, um, you know, finding all sorts of fun things to uh, <laughs> continue with. Oh, great. The next question we have here is from Michael, and they're asking, are there any remote work opportunities for a health sciences librarian, and are they less common? There are, and there are increasingly more of those opportunities. So many of the, um, one of the places that I were, one of the settings that I mentioned were um, research institutes or, um, you know, there are entire sort of, they are often referred to as evidence-based centers. So places that are conducting systematic reviews in, um, you know, in health, so, really involved health research, um, they typically hire remote librarians to conduct searches for them. So that has been increasing. I have seen a lot more opportunities to do that. I have also seen a lot more, most of those remote jobs are going to be in research. So that requires a certain kind of, um, you know, personality or a certain kind of uh, temperament and um, not everybody might like that. Um, I've also seen a lot of those kinds of research jobs in um, pharmaceutical companies and uh, medical devices companies. So any sort of er area that is really um, interested in discovery. Um, I have seen some remote uh, jobs for librarians, for health sciences librarians in academic libraries. Primarily that would be for people, for um, universities that offer distance learning in those areas. And there are a few of those. So, um, you know, typically they're hybrid, hybrid um, programs where the um, academic work is being done remotely and of course the clinical work is done on site wherever the person lives. So you can find those as well. Yeah, there are more of those. In fact, um, I just saw a couple of different jobs that somebody sent to me uh, today, you know, to one was in California and another one was, oh, in Illinois. The, um, American College of Pathology has a job posted right now that is a remote librarian job. That's excellent. It's actually really good to know. Um, sorry if you hear some noise in the background. And I'm wondering myself personally if maybe the pandemic has kind of shown like the need for more <laughs> librarians in the medical field. Um, and kind of, I'm just kind of curious on like what you've seen. <laughs> if you want to give a little snippet of that and your experience. <laughs> well, I think I think that, that that's really true. It's just, it's not just a, um, you know, it made it easier for us to envision that worker environment, right? As a, um, as sort of a constant because so many of us, we had to do it and we did all, we all did it successfully. So I think that um, many, um, many places have also discovered that especially in areas that um, like research where it's not necessarily to really have 
people in the same room to discover to collaborate that is um that can sort of um you know expand their candidate pool because people from all over the country would be eligible to apply and it also saves them money right because then they don't have to pay for relocation costs and other issues if they are fine if they find a candidate who lives in a different part of the country so it really um i mean it's kind of funny it's interesting for us right because we as sjsu students have been um navigating this landscape for a long time in fact it, this was one of the when my library went into the complete remote work um one of the things that i did was you know share all of our all of my experiences from running this group organizing events for this group with um, my co-workers because so many things that um, you know used to be considered the professional way of dealing with each other through media such as um, instant messaging or emailing just don't apply if you are working in the environment all the time right i remember when i took my 203 class at um, sjsu um, whoever my facilitator or instructor was said forget that whole idea of not using emoji in an email or in text mess or an instant message you have to do it when you never see people in person because otherwise how are you going to know what they mean right so small things like that but um, also helping the school because we had experience already with um, online or you know remote convocations help um, OHSU organize that for their students. I volunteered to do that and they were extremely grateful for that help. So um, yes, I think you're absolutely right, is that this has opened the opportunities for many health sciences librarians. And it also has given people an opportunity to just sort of um, start dabbling in it and developing their, um, you know, developing their professional personas and see what area they really want to go go into and if doing something remotely like that is really for them. Excellent. Thank you so much, Vasha, for that. I, I love hearing the insight on it. I love how relevant it is and how we're all kind of going through it in real time, <laughs> which is really, really cool. Um, the next question we have is actually from the lovely Tina here, and I'm going to pass the mic to her so she can ask. Hi, Pasha, and thank you, Rebecca, uh, for passing it over. I was just, when you were saying that, like, working at Health Sciences Library is kind of like running a small business, could you kind of elaborate on what you mean by that analogy? Is it because it's a small team? or is it I, Yes, I was, so I was specifically talking about, um, for from my experience, about hospital libraries, because mm -hmm. you're really responsible for everything there right so okay. obviously the library director uh, you do all of the things such as budget and um, hiring and all of that but at the same time you're completely responsible for the physical space mm -hmm. the scheduling the um, you know when i was um, working as a hospital librarian for the team at providence yeah I was, in addition to doing reference work and, you know, teaching and doing all this other stuff, mm -hmm. I was also the systems person there. I was wow. administering all of the resources first for just my tiny little hospital where I worked. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, once it became a system library service, that meant, um, you know, doing the administering the resources for 52 hospitals. Wow. Okay. So, um, you know, you sometimes you might be dusting shelves if you are having somebody come in and you want it to look really pretty i'm kidding about that a little bit but you know back in the day when there were actual stationary li right libraries you may have been shelving books mm -hmm. right which in an academic library a librarian never does there's a student doing that or somebody else but at the same time you would be doing you would be going to um, executive medical executive committee meeting meetings or all of those things so you're dealing with administration as well as sweeping basically wow. that is not true um, in academic and health sciences libraries definitely there's a lot more um, you know the work is far more siloed so there are different groups of librarians doing different okay. things and there's a whole support staff and everybody else and in um, research centers you just have your one little silo of work so you don't worry about any of those other things okay cool 
Thank you. And then I just have one more um, question. You said that you don't necessarily have to have a health sciences or medical background, but have you noticed that that has been the case among your colleagues and the people that you've met in your field? Or do you think that most people it's, it's just coming from like a library background, regardless of undergrad or other degrees? There are definitely people who do have some of those degrees. I know librarians who were originally nurses and then got their MLISs and uh, went in that direction. I know academic librarians often do feel pressure to get additional degrees. And so there are a mm -hmm. lot of librarians, um, health sciences librarians who also have um, masters of public health or other okay. degrees. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's really, it depends on what settings you are in and what okay. the requirements are for your job. When it's required, it's typically very clearly stated. Okay. Um, I've never found it to be the fact that I am not a, that I'm a humanist and a social scientist and not a hard sciences person yeah. has never really stopped me because okay. in any yeah. way and uh, you know I have worked with clinical teams for many years so um, the important thing is to really learn how to listen and to yeah. invest the time in okay. learning on the spot so I think that those are the kind of tricks that you really don't be afraid to ask, but also listen very carefully. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I found is that what is really more helpful is having that kind of holistic view. So what, which right. is why I was stressing, stay on top of the literature of right. everything of stuff that is going on in the field so that you understand the clinical part, but you also know why we're doing things that way. There are just, that is far more helpful, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. It's very reassuring. Also, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to have these takeaways. Yeah. I see we're at time, so yeah. I don't want to hold it, hold, you know, yeah. anybody hostage here. I know that every um oh hello Dr. D. So very nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. D has been a wonderful mentor, so I'm sure that you all have already discovered that. And um she's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Great to see you, Basha. Great well, to see I you. go back a long way. She <laughs> and I began with her husband, this uh, particular group. We sort of regenerated it. It was going for a while and then it faded away. And we had an awful lot of fun. We continued to see each other. That's right. Uh, at meetings. And I've been to Portland and we've done a lot of touring. We've One thing about medical librarians is they are a very, very friendly group. Yes. We are very close knitted and we feel very free to call someone and ask them for help. If I had a question that I thought Basha could answer, I have no problem about calling her or any of my other colleagues. We're very close. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I completely agree. And I was going to do a pitch, make a quick pitch for, um, you know, if you decide to do, and anybody should feel free to email me and um you know ask me any questions that you want to about this also but if you want to be uh, you think you want to be a medical librarian join your local um chapter you don't have to join the national medical library association at first the local chapters have very inexpensive i don't you know um inexpensive student memberships they typically started i i think at like ten dollars maybe that's i know that that's the pacific northwest chapter charges ten dollars and there are often scholarships to do that to do it um to join so join and see what's happening locally because you will get some great opportunities to net network with your friends and uh you will really get to see what's happening locally, what what people are into, and you will meet a lot of great librarians who will then help you find a job. <laughs> I think that most jobs in the medical library field come from who you know. Joining all of these organizations, particularly at the local level, if someone hears about a job, they'll think of you or they will have you in mind. By being that networking type of a library field, we watch each other and we particularly are interested in students. The Medical Library so Association is very interested and that's why they're very fond of the local chapters and they support them and are interested in your helping them. That's part of our job in the medical library field is to look for the new people. Mm -hmm. And Basha answered the question very well about a background 
you need a broad background, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the medical field. You're looking for people that are learners, people who are people people, people who can deal with physicians or deal with the research. So it's a broad base of whatever you happen to be able to promote yourself in whatever field you're doing. It's a very dynamic field, and I think this is what distinguishes medical librarianship really from other special librarianship, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're dealing with any kind of um, patient care needs. Sometimes you have to drop everything and do your search right then and there, and you have to deliver all the information to physicians, right, or the to the clinicians right there because there's somebody there. I've had calls when people are saying patient is coming in five minutes I need this information right so then you have to you mm -hmm. really do drop everything and you do the research for them and you provide the information that you can back in the day before um, <laughs> before modern technology sometimes I had to read parts of the article to a nurse who was standing in the operating room as the physician was fully scrubbed in so she would be holding the phone next to him so he could hear what I was saying those things are um, unusual, but they do happen, and they're not so unusual that I'm the only person who's had this experience. So you will hear these. It's a very different feel that, in that way. Very there's, powerful and meaningful. Yes. So there's a lot to consider. So, but I know we're over time, so I don't want to take up anybody's time. Thank you so much for inviting me and letting me spread the good word about medical librarianship look out for your um local chapters i want you to know if anybody any of you is um living in the pacific northwest is that we give out um student scholarships so join us wonderful to see you amy also yes. <laughs> thank you so much Baja. Your, your anecdotes really liven enliven <laughs> thank the you experience of a medical librarian. thank you for sharing those information my pleasure thank you Basha. So we will share the recording with everyone. And if you're interested, please take our survey. And we hope to see you next semester for our spring programming. Thank you so much for joining. And have a nice night, everyone. Thank you.